From the beginning of Mark, the reader knows who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of God, Mark 1.1. However, people in the story struggle with understanding just who he is and what he is all about, except for those with demons. They know exactly who he is. The demons recognize him and wither before his mighty words. But Jesus rather consistently commands that they keep this information quiet. Why this command for secrecy? Bible students for centuries have mulled over this question. Well, it's Thursday here on Whistling Hope. Wherever you are viewing us from, we are so happy that you have joined us for this week's study, Tried and Crucified. In the house we have Pastor Nisi Lafleur and Pastor Orville Joseph. I'm going to invite both of them to greet us and then we'll ask Pastor Joseph to pray for us to jump into this hot topic for today. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a joy to be with you this morning. I pray that God has been real good to you and that your week has been going real great so far, that you have gotten a lot of opportunities to give God praise and, and thanks for all that he has done for you. May he continue to be with you and bless you as we approach the weekend. I just want to say a special good morning to all the members of the Whispering Hope family, those out in the UK, those scattered across the Caribbean. It is my hope that as we study this day's lesson that we will certainly get a fresh glimpse of what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did for us. And may we all be blessed. Welcome to study today. Uh, can I invite you now to just kindly bow your heads as we pray, loving God and our Heavenly Father, we just want to give you thanks and praise your most much listening because you're worthy to be praised. Uh, Father, as you come this morning, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us as we um, interact with your word. We pray that you will guide our thoughts and that uh, he will enlighten us as to a better understanding of your word. May we see you revealed clearly in the word as we study today. We want to pray for those who are studying with us. I pray that you will bless them, strengthen them, watch over them, protect them, and give them the assurance of your salvation. Continue to be with us and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this week, we're looking at the life of Christ, first being tried and then crucified. And today we focus on laid to rest. So I'm going to ask both of you, laid to rest and tried and crucified. Let's connect them. Tell us all here on Whispering Hope how this connect. For me, I want to say tried and crucified. At the end of the crucifixion, my Jesus did die, as was prophesied, and he was laid to rest. This defeats some of the myths that go around that Jesus did not die. He was tried, he was crucified, he died, and he was laid to rest. Yes, uh, so again, you know, in terms of our connection this week, we're talking today about laid to rest. Uh, and the reason why Jesus has been laid to rest is because he was tried, crucified, rejected by men and women to whom he had ministered for the last three and a half years, rejected by those who clearly followed him, the crowd, the multitude that followed him through through his ministry. But now he's alone, resting in that place, that tomb, awaiting the third day when he will rise again. Amen. So let's look at our memory text coming from Mark 15, verse 34. It says, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Pastors, help us to unpack the emotions, exactly what all this text brings to our mind. Again, here we hear Jesus calling out to the, the Father, you know, my God, my God, why, why hast thou forsaken me some people prefer another rendering of it my god my god why are you 
you know, my father, why are you handing me over? And what it speaks to is the agony and pain that comes from, from separation. And so the very fact that um, Jesus is now bearing the sins of the entire world gives him an understanding, an appreciation, if I must put it that way, of how sin separates and the pain and agony that comes from that separation. Beautiful, da. You know, Mrs. White speaks about the agony of the separation from God, that as he is now taking on the sins of the world to die, the agony of being separated from his father causes him to cry out, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you left me here? And you know, certainly it helps us to really understand the awfulness of sin and how painful it is to be separated from Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, all this week we looked at the trial, looked at his crucifixion, we looked at how he was treated before being crucified, and now we're on to being laid to rest. And, you know, Mark gives us a view into the actual episode of him being laid to rest. And it takes us to Mark 15, verses 42 to 47. And I'll read it in your hearing, and then they'll have some follow-up questions. So, and when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God coming and taking courage went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead and summoned the centurion. He asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled the stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. And so my question to both of you, what is the significance of Joseph of Arimathea's intervention, especially since all of Jesus' disciples were nowhere to be seen? If I venture to say, at a cursory glance, superficial glance, Jesus' close inner circle is not around at this time. They may have been afraid of being persecuted, but it shows that God's mission, as outlined in his word through prophecy, is not going to be abandoned. Meaning, his disciples were not around, but there was somebody else in place to fulfill the prophecy of his burial. There was someone else, not uh, someone now of repute that would be able. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was, he, Joseph of Arimathea was a big guy, but yet still he was sufficiently touched by Jesus's ministry to ensure that he was properly disposed of and buried according to prophecy. We will not be left alone even in times of persecution, or even when those of our inner circle might be afraid to stand with us. Very interesting that Joseph of, of Aramathia kind of intervened at this point in time. I like very much what Pastor Lafleur said in terms of him being abandoned and alienated more or less by his major followers and nobody left there to to intervene on in there but yet still you know joseph a prominent a prominent person stands in contrast with the prominent jews who who were sitting on the sanhedrin who were part of the trial and condemnation of jesus but he in turn gathered up the boldness to be able to be there and also to be uh, able to approach Pilate in terms of seeking to have the body of Jesus Christ so that he can be given a good burial. I think it speaks profoundly of men of courage who were able to stand up even when all around them would have fled and there is no reason why they should stand. As a matter of fact, the order of the lesson makes the point that Joseph's prominence is only highlighted here, at least according to Mark. 
In the rest of the gospel, he's literally absent. Others are given prominence, but at this point in time, you know, he is given prominence and he is given prominence because of his boldness. Um, of his commitment, of his dedication, a desire to use whatever resources he had for Jesus Christ, even in his death. You know, when we go back to Mark 15, particularly verse 43 says that he himself, Joseph of Arimathea, he was waiting for God's kingdom. So although he was a member of the Sanhedrin council and he had means, he was a believer. And for me, that says a lot. And so sometimes... What seemed like an impossibility because, you know, think about it. The disciples really didn't have means to really wrap Jesus up. They didn't have no tomb or no way they could put him because they were all strugglers. They left everything struggling. They all left everything to follow him. But God always makes a way that Joseph could come and say, hey, I want his body. And it says a lot. And, you know. So his tomb, never used by anyone, was prepared just for Jesus. And that just helps me to understand how nothing happens without God's knowledge. Everything is always planned. And even in the case of Jesus' death and where he was to be laid, it was already organized. You know, people have questioned throughout the ages that if Jesus is a historical figure and if he died. Did he really die? Some suggested he was actually a person. But on the cross, he simply fainted. He didn't die. How would you respond to these reasoning or these logics if they're such that people are saying he didn't really die? He's not really a historical figure. What evidence can we find to prove that Jesus indeed was a real figure and he actually died? Okay. So let's just recap as we seek to answer this. When Joseph approached Pilate, Pilate had commissioned a centurion to be in charge of the whole crucifixion. The first thing, Pilate was shocked that Jesus had actually died so quickly. And so he sends his trusted centurion to visit to ensure that Jesus was dead, dead. And that centurion's security report suggested that he is dead. And that is historical proof that the Jesus of Nazareth that was hung on the cross was not substituted by any fake Jesus of Nazareth. The centurion confirms that he is dead. And I would simply respond to the questioning by pointing to the centurion's report which is an actual historical happening, which is an actual testament of the fact that Jesus died on the cross and his death was not just a simple fainting, but it was double-checked and reported as an actual death. Very well put, Pastor. It is, it is the record as given by Mark and Others and his other contemporaries, the other gospel uh, as well, attest to the very fact. I always make the argument that the gospel remains some of the old, oldest literary evidence of that particular time in history. And so they speak in a very profound way about what transpired at the time. And here Mark is recording that at the time that Joseph comes to ask for the body of Jesus Christ, that, that, um, that Pilate was surprised that he, that he was dead already, which is testament, one, to the fact that the engagement of Pilate in the process of the death of Jesus Christ. It is testament to the fact that even on, on, Pilate, on the level of Pilate, there is a, a need for verification that Jesus was dead. And the fact that that was verified is clear evidence. I, I think later on, as we come to the resurrection itself, you will recognize that that in itself too, when the soldiers were challenged to keep it quiet, uh, that's the evidence that something miraculous had happened on the Sunday morning. So that when we talk about Jesus' death, it is not mere speculation, but it is a historical fact that we are referencing. Amen. I want to thank you for that clarification, both Dr. Lafleur and Dr. Joseph. So what if Jesus had not died? And what is the meaning of his death? And how is that important to us today? Does that have any implications for us living today? 
I would say uh, if Jesus had not died, the world will continue on its road for sin, a degradation, and self-destruction. If Jesus hadn't died, all of creation would have no hope. Uh, if Jesus hadn't died, then, you know, God himself would be brought into serious question because as the, the, the apostle says that God had, even before the foundation of the world began, had already orchestrated a plan that if sin were to end to the world that Jesus Christ would have come and died for our sins. So if Jesus didn't die, then certainly we would be in peril. But if Jesus didn't die, certainly that would make God a liar as well, because he promised that Jesus would have been the answer to the sin problem. And I just want to add, if Jesus had, building on what Pastor Joseph said, if Jesus didn't die, then there would be no answer to the problem of sin. And that's a predicament for the human family. Wow, very powerful stuff, pastors. His death means everything. Not just his death, but his resurrection. But they come into that next week. Come into that next week. So, how ironic that Jesus' followers are missing in action. He's dead. They're not there to claim the body. While a member of the Sanhedrin, the very body that they condemn, Jesus, becomes the hero here. How can we be sure that in crucial times, we are not missing in action either? One of my favorite writers said that what the greatest want of, um, of the world are, are men, men who are honest and true, men who are true to duty as they little pole. You know, uh, to be able to get somebody from the Sanhedrin, somebody from the echelon of society, somebody who, whose status and, and integrity is tied up, let me put it that way, is tied up with his colleagues and, and those in his class. For him to risk moving away, diverging from their particular stand, certainly is heroic, as the question raised. It's certainly something to take note of, that somebody in the midst of almost consensus agreeing that Jesus should be crucified would stand up and stand for Jesus when everybody else would have abandoned him. It speaks volume. And I think in today's world as well, we need men and women who are able to stand up, um, stand up for the lesser fortunate, stand up for those who are ill-treated, stand up for those who are oppressed, stand, stand up for those who are marginalized, stand up for those who have, who have nobody else to stand up and speak up for them. And I think that is what Joseph did. And we need more men and women like him. Yes, you know, one of the things that struck me, that the followers were missing in action because it could have been because of self-preservation want to ensure that if this is happening to the master it must not happen to me but here is a man who was looking for the kingdom of god who had not believed as much as these disciples had who rallies around the master to the end i want us to look sometimes at how concerned we become about self preservation and we could as the question asks be missing sometimes because we think of us and not the greater good of the work amen from the discussion this morning as we focus on jesus being laid to rest you know we looked at him being crucified we looked at him being spat in his face you know being beaten with a cat or nine he did he suffered so much for us but we're so happy that's not the end so, pastors, what are your takeaways from this week's lesson? My main takeaway is the crucifixion was real. Jesus died and paid the price for sin. And therefore, I can trust in my God. As a lesson, this week talks about the ironies and the irony of, I, I talk about the irony of ironies. If the very fact, while he was on the cross dying for us that we were engaged in a vicious war against him and yet still he died we were crucifying him for our for our glory and our self-satisfaction but he was dying for our redemption and liberation and i'm saying that you know i just thank god every day for the mercies that he has made available to me as a the wise man says they are new every they are new every morning. And I just want to give him praise. Amen. There's so much that we can take away from this lesson today. But I just want to think of this song that says, Because you live, I can face 
tomorrow. Because he lives, all fears, they're gone. Because I know, I know he holds my future in his hand. And so whatever it is that you may be struggling with this morning, Jesus knows. He loves you. He gave his life for you. And he's asking you to fully surrender. He died on a cross for you. And he's calling you back. To that backslider, to that church member who has not fully committed, God loves you and wants you back. And so we just want to thank you for being tuned in with us here on Whispering Hope. It has really been a fruitful discussion as we looked at the topic lead to rest. You know, we invite you each and every morning to study with us. But before I go, I must let you know about a great event that's taking place on the 28th of September, right at Tyndale Seventh Adventist Church. God's New Generation Benefit Concert for the Homeless. Round two is ready. We're practicing. We're ready. And so we're inviting all of Antigua to come and to worship with us. The theme is Pressing On. And our concert will be featuring our known soloist here, Brother Sean Joseph. And so it's an invitation. Bring an offering. It starts at 6.30. Don't worry. We will have supper that you can purchase. All this is going to help us feed the homeless. So we're looking forward. We want you to full Tyndale Temple. It promises to be great. If you thought the first one was amazing, then this one is even just as powerful. Watch the Holy Spirit pour out on our young people. So until I see you tomorrow morning on Whispering Hope, God bless.